Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome back or welcome to our conference proceedings. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Richard Nolan, one of the co-organizers of this conference. Uh, and before I turn to today's proceedings, I'd just like to say a very big thank you to Hang Wu, Yip Man and Ying Liu. I had some health issues towards the end of last year and the beginning of this year, which was, I'm glad to say, nothing whatsoever to do with COVID-19 and all now resolved. But it meant I couldn't do as much as I planned to in organising the conference. And all of Hang Wu, Yip Man and Ying Liu really stepped up to the plate and took more than their fair share of the burden of organising. So special thank you to you that I wanted to note. Welcome then to the second day of our fourth conference and our theme this year, of course, is philanthropy in the age of COVID-19, Asian and global perspectives. And there's no one better suited to give an Asian perspective on philanthropy than our keynote speaker today, Mevesh Mumtad Ahmed. Mevesh is the Director of Research at the Centre for Asian Philanthropy and Society. She's the driving force behind their policy and applied research including creation of the Doing Good Index, which was mentioned by Hang Wu yesterday, for those of you who were here yesterday, and we'll be hearing more about that shortly. Mevesh has extensive experience in research, analysis and management, principally for our purposes in the not-for-profit sector, but she also has considerable experience in the mainstream commercial sector. Amongst other very high profile appointments, she's worked for the World Bank, the United Nations Development Programme, and for the Mayor's Office in New York City. Her academic background is extremely strong, holding degrees both from LSE and from Princeton's. Proceedings today will be in the same format as yesterday, which means that Mebesh will present for around 40 minutes, and then there'll be about 15 minutes for questions. Could we please keep to time? It is important given that uh, lots of people are in different time zones and particularly for those for whom it's really quite late in the evening. If you do have a question, could you please put it in the chat so that I can see it and introduce it. So thank you all for coming again and I'll hand over now to Mevesh to begin her presentation. Thank you so much, Richard. And I just want to add my thanks to yours and really thank um, yourself, uh, Ying Lu, Hang Wu, and Yip Man um, for putting this conference together. It's an absolute delight to be here. And uh, what I will try and do is not speak for 40 minutes. I'll try and stick to within 30 minutes so that we can have more um, of a Q&A uh, or try to wrap it up even um, earlier if possible. But I tend to make that commitment and not quite keep to it. So that's why I'm giving myself some, some leeway. Um, so I just want to start by briefly introducing uh, the organization that I work for so you have a little bit of a background on what CAPS does and why we are doing the kind of work and research that I will be talking about today. Uh, CAPS is a, um, an organization that is based in Hong Kong. We're headquartered in Hong Kong, but we look at all of Asia. We cover 18 economies in Asia, 16 countries, plus Hong Kong and Taiwan. And our goal is to maximize private social investment. And that means all the ways in which private capital, whether it's corporate philanthropy, family or individual philanthropy, um, CSR, uh, or increasingly impact investment, all the ways in which private capital is going towards meeting social and environmental needs. And we recognize that for this to happen, there needs to be more knowledge and insights and data informing strategic decision-making. So we are mainly a research organization uh, we go out and collect our own uh, data because it does not really exist in Asia. And then we analyze it and we um, publish it on, on, um, in reports that are available on our websites, caps.org. I encourage you to take a look at that or wait for me to summarize some of our highlights. Um, so with that, what I'll do is just start sharing my screen and walk you through some of our findings, but really focusing on what our the trends in private social investment across Asia. And I'll start by introducing what the Doing Good Index is and um, why it's important because it's given us a critical amount uh, and type of data that is helping us see what these broad trends across the region are. And I'm hoping after that we can have a, uh, a good discussion on some of our findings. 
I have some questions for our audience that I'm hoping you can engage with. Uh, so let's get started. This will come as no surprise to anyone here. The world absolutely faces unprecedented challenges. Um, we have the existential threat of climate change. We can't afford to wait anymore to tackle that. Uh, Asia particularly is vulnerable to that. 99 of the 100 most at-risk cities from climate, climate change happen to be in Asia. Even before the pandemic hit, there were other issues. Multitudes of children were still out of school. Access to water was a problem. Aging populations were straining resources. And then on top of that came the pandemic. And as we all know, the pandemic has really upended the world, strained already stretched resources, and really um, you know, created uh, difficulty, but also opportunities for um, more kinds of intervention and interactions. Um, but let's take a quick look at what Asia is, has been facing. Just in the last year and a half alone, Asia has lost 140 million full-time jobs. An additional 90 million Asians may actually end up back in poverty. And we know that almost 850 million children have had their education disrupted. So these are big seismic shifts on top of existing challenges. And the social sector has absolutely risen to the occasion. And by social sector, I mean organizations that are actually delivering social services, but also institutions that are supporting them whether those are governments, whether those are um, corporations and individuals, um, wealth owners, everyone who has been partaking in this is part of the social sector. So what has the social sector been doing? I'm sure, um, I know but there are participants from Singapore, from Australia, from Indonesia, other countries around Asia. We know that social sector organizations really stepped up from PPP and mask distribution to food distribution, to um, 3D printing, there were social organizations that pivoted to making 3D um, ventilators. So at all stages of the pandemic and in all kinds of uh, ways that, that they could help, social sector organizations have been stepping up and helping. And what this means is that now more than ever, it is critical to maximize more private social investment to make sure that there are more, even more resources that are flowing into this space to, make, to um, both continue to support pandemic response, but to really help us build back better. We hear this a lot, build back better. And you know, it's, it's cliched for a reason because both we hear it a lot, but two, it is true. We do need to build a society that is more compassionate, that is more equitable, and that is, more, uh, that is kinder to the environment. So let's see what can be done. Um, we need to, like I just said, firstly, maximize private social investment, but to remove one of the biggest impediments to this maximization, and that is the trust deficit. Uh, we speak to many ultra high net worth individuals and business leaders around Asia, and when we ask them, why don't you give more? The main answer is because we don't know where our money will go. We don't know, we don't have enough transparency, enough visibility into the flow of funding. And that leads to a trust deficit that is compounded by other things like um, the Doing Good Index, which I'll just introduce in a minute, covers 18 Asian economies. In 13 out of those 18, there have been front page scandals involving the social sector in the last couple of years alone. These kinds of things affect the donations and the funding that flows to the social sector. So it's really the need of the hour to continue to work towards mitigating the trust deficit so that more social investment can flow into the sector. And the final um, area where more needs to be done is, is in, allowing, in aligning incentives around doing good. Um, we want more social delivery organizations, organizations that can be nonprofit or for-profit social enterprises that are delivering social services. We want more of them. We want them to do more. We want more resources flowing into the sector. So we want companies and asset owners to be better incentivized to contribute and to support the sector. And finally, we want government, which does have a strong mandate to look after everyone, to support uh, greater social investment and greater contribution from the private sector and the social sector. And this is why the Doing Good Index is important. 
it's a first of its kind study that looks at the factors that both enable and hinder private social investment across Asia, across 16 countries plus uh, Hong Kong and Taiwan. And the reason that it's critical to look at this is because without this infrastructure, this supporting infrastructure for social investment being there, we're not going to see the kind of resources flow towards social needs and environmental needs that the world reads, needs right now. Um, so what does the Doing Good Index do? It looks at uh, the levers that hinder or enable the flow of social investment. And we divide these levers. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how it's structured before diving into what we find, which is um, much juicier. The way it's structured is um, the, there are regulatory levers. That's one part of the index. And that includes how easy it is for organizations to set up and to operate. How easy is it for funding to flow within borders and across borders, et cetera. The second group of levers are those incentives that I was talking about. And these take mainly the form of tax subsidies that encourage donation. A third group of levers that can enable social investment, private social investment, uh, uh, is, uh, uh, falls under procurement, which is the government directly soliciting, purchasing services from the social sector. And the fourth one is ecosystem, which is about how society perceives social delivery organizations and social institutions, how corporates and universities interact with these institutions. Uh, what are the perceptions around talent? Is there a talent gap in the sector? Basically all the ways in which society interacts with and supports or is held back from supporting social delivery organizations. So that's the Doing Good Index in a nutshell. But what's critical, really important about the index is the potential that it highlights. If the right levers were in place, and Asians were to give up to 2% of their GDP to the social sector. The 2% is uh, typically what um, uh, the private social investment that flows to the social sector in the US. So if Asians were to give up to 2% of GDP to the social sector, that unleashes $587 billion a year, that's US dollars, much needed uh, more than half a trillion a year. And to put that in perspective, that is 12 times the foreign aid that flows through the 18 Asian economies that we look at. It is also one third of the cost of achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals by 2030 on target. So this is big, this is big money, big capital that um, we're talking about. Let's see how the economies that we look at actually do. Um, and just after this, I'm going to start explaining uh, what all of this data is telling, that, telling us about the five main trends in social investment that we see across Asia. So you'll see um, on the screen that there are four clusters. Economies have been divided into um, how well they are doing in building a nurturing, enabling infrastructure for private social investment. The economies that are doing well, and Singapore and Taiwan are in that group, are out ahead, then we have about six economies that are doing better, uh, eight or nine that are doing okay, and then we have Cambodia and Nepal that are the laggards. And I can tell you a little bit about why um, these economies are clustered here. Let me just quickly add that the economies are arranged in alphabetical order, so not performance. Now, why are Singapore and Taiwan in the doing well group? They have a lot of the rules and regulations around encouraging social investment in place. Um, and I would love to hear from some, some of the lawyers and legal scholars in the audience what their experience is and whether they agree. Um, Singapore, for example, has the highest tax subsidy for donations in, I think, the world. It's 250%. So for every dollar that a Singaporean donates to a, a charity, two and a half dollars are really taken off their tax bill. That's, that's a huge um, incentive. Uh, Taiwan is not that far behind at 100%. Um, but even for these two economies that are doing well, there's actually a fifth cluster that should be here, which is doing excellent. And the reason that's missing is because even the top performing economies have a way to go before filling those gaps. And for Singapore, 
Um, some of those gaps are in uh, cross-sector collaborations and how to improve them, and others are in community initiatives, community-driven initiatives. Uh, Taiwan is facing a, a major talent shortage that is holding it back. Let's look at the second cluster, the economies that are doing better. Most of them have good regulations, tax incentives, and procurement in place, but it's the ecosystem bit where performance is a little more mixed. So the way that companies are engaging, the way that universities are engaging, whether they have national volunteering days or national giving days. So you know, to the, the infrastructure for society really engaging with um, social delivery organizations is not as strong in the doing better group. Uh, and there's a lot of variation in this group where countries can actually learn from each other. So Vietnam, for example, is a leader in offering tax incentives. Philippines has one of the most, in fact, probably the most engaged corporate sector in terms of volunteering and sitting on nonprofit boards. Uh, Pakistan has put in place procurement policies that are designed to encourage nonprofits uh, and give them a competitive edge in the bidding process. So there's a lot of learning here. The doing okay cluster is, is a mix. Um, there were three economies in this in 2018. I should mention quickly that the Doing Good Index 2020 is just the second time that the Doing Good Index was published. The first iteration was in 2018, the second in 2020, and the next one is coming out next year in 2022. Um, so in the Doing OK cluster, there is uh, performance is mixed on regulations um, and uh, tax incentives. A few are here because of governance and trust issues. And a few of these economies um, have actually come into this cluster from not doing enough because they have actually improved their transparency uh, and regulatory environment. And these two were actually Indonesia and Myanmar, although Myanmar has seen a, uh, we, we're seeing a, understandably a severe reversal in uh, uh, the situation in Myanmar thanks to recent events. Um, and then finally, the last cluster are those economies that are not doing enough. And just to let you know, these are the two newcomers um, in 2020. We did not include Cambodia and Nepal in 2018. And what we find is that both of them have emerging philanthropic environments that still require improvements, whether it's along regulations or taxes. We also found that in Cambodia and Nepal, for either individuals or corporations, uh, tax subsidies were set at zero. So either individuals or corporations were not receiving any incentives to donate. So that's a, um, a kind of a snapshot of um, how economies performed in the Doing Good Index 2020. And I'll be happy to speak more to that later uh, if you're curious to learn more. Now, in 2022, we, we've already started collecting the data. Um, and we're basing a lot of the new questions on the impact of COVID. So um, stay tuned for that. That should come out uh, early next year. Now, so we've collected all this data. The index, for example, is based on a survey of more than 2,000 organizations that deliver social services across Asia, plus interviews of uh, more than 150 experts, uh, again, spread out across Asia. So there's all this rich data that we have captured for the Doing Good Index, but also for some of our other work. What does this data and this research actually tell us about trends across Asia? There are five key trends that we see emerging. And the first one is that governments continue to play a pivotal role. For anyone who works in Asia or on Asia, you will know that governments loom really large in Asia in a way that may not necessarily be reflected outside of Asia. And this has um, a few challenges, but it also has a lot of opportunities because it means that when government puts in place policies that signal support for social investment, institutions are likely to listen. Um, in Asia, institutions, companies, businesses, and government tend to work in tandem. They tend to not butt heads, but work aligned. And that is helpful when, say, um, the government signals support for the social sector by offering tax deductions. Across Asia, there's a huge range. Like I said, Singapore tops the tax table with a 250% rate of tax deduction. Cambodia and Nepal uh, make up the rear. But really, what's 
arguably even more important than the numbers, you know, whether it's 250% or zero or 100, is the signal that goes out when the government says tax subsidy is 100% or 250%. The signal is companies, ultra high net worth individuals, everyone, we want you to support social delivery organizations. And that's a signal that Asian institutions and individuals tend to respond to. Um, another signal that is important is whether the government has mandated a national giving day. And here we see that across the 18 economies that we look at, about only about four have national giving days, uh, China, Korea, Vietnam, and Singapore actually has a national giving week. Um, a third way in which we see that government continues to play a pivotal role is it's what it's doing to support social enterprises. Um, so you, you've heard me use the term social delivery organization. And what I mean by that are nonprofits and other organizations like social enterprises that are delivering social services. We're seeing a rise of social enterprises around Asia, and I'll talk to that, um, uh, I'll speak to that in, in a few minutes. But what I want you to, to notice here is that governments across Asia are beginning to recognize that and support social entrepreneurship. We did a study covering um, six economies, Hong Kong, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Pakistan, and Thailand. And we found that in just these six economies, the government was spending $100 million on social enterprises alone, and another 900 million on all kinds of startups that include social enterprises. So we've seen big public resources, government resources beginning to flow to support social entrepreneurship. And where we observe more government support, we did observe a more dynamic uh, ecosystem for social entrepreneurship. So government plays a critical role uh, in Asia. That doesn't mean that government does no wrong, and I'll speak to that uh, in a little bit as well, or perhaps we can share some stories in the Q&A. Um, but for now, let's, let me walk you through a couple more ways in which um, what the government governments in Asia are doing is so important. We know that one of the key impediments to private social investment uh, being maximized is a lack of trust. And this is where regulations that help build transparency and accountability are absolutely key. Um, Key to those regulations being in place and being complied with is also how easy they are to understand. And here the picture begins to look a little mixed. So our survey shows that about half of all organizations across Asia actually found regulations pertaining to them very difficult to understand. And this is uh, you know, somewhere where, where, where the lawyers could play a role, but um, these laws are difficult to interpret and understand. And when they are difficult to understand, they are difficult to comply with. So um, that's an area for improvement, a gap um, in this space. There's another important um, you know, kind of a trend we're seeing in regulations, which is that in 10 of the 18 economies that we're looking at, regulations related to the social sector are fluctuating, they're changing. Now you might ask, why is that a problem? The reason that it is having a dampening effect in most of these economies is that fluctuating regulations create uncertainty. And while it's absolutely necessary to have regulations that build uh, you know, accountability and transparency, if regulatory changes are signaling to organizations that there is suspicion or that the government is not trusting them, their enthusiasm and their ability to do their work is likely to be hampered. So we, we're watching how, what kind of form, you know, final shape these regulations finally take. But for now, we are observing that fluctuations are uh, spooking the sector. Now, um, one final point about government, uh, and I mentioned this briefly before, is procurement. Procuring social services directly from the social sector has two um, positive impacts. One is that, um, it can legitimize organizations in the social sector because if the government is procuring services, for example, in Hong Kong, um, hospitals are outsourced to a nonprofit called the Tonghua Group. So if the government is procuring uh, medical services from the social sector, that helps build greater trust in the social sector. And it also encourages 
social sector organizations to grow their footprint, to become larger and provide even more social services. So there's legitimacy and growth. And we see this happening all around Asia. I think Singapore is actually one of the economies where we see a lot of procurement. About a third of the, the social delivery organizations in Singapore have procurement contracts uh, with the government. It's no surprise that China has the highest percentage at 63%. But what we have observed between 2020 and 2018, as you can see from the graph, um, uh, from the circle on the left, is that procurement seems to be declining across the region. So from about a third in um, 2018, it's come down to about a quarter in 2020. It's something that we would like to see um, actually go up. But the point I want you to, I, I want to leave you with when it comes to government and regulations is something that we like to say, which is that Regulations are like cholesterol. There's good cholesterol and there's bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is absolutely critical. The, the sector needs it. And, but the point is that in the pursuit of transparency and accountability and clarity, there has to be a balance. And that balance has to be, uh, that balance is critical in um, signaling that the overall approach of government is to one of support, of enabling and not only of um, scrutiny. So that's the point I want to leave you with in the first trend, which is that government is absolutely pivotal in Asia. The second trend that we see across Asia in social investment is location. Um, Asians tend to operate locally. They tend to give locally. And by local, I mean within the country. So cross-border giving is... Uh, not as common. Giving within borders is even more is, is much more common. And the pandemic has actually accelerated this trend. The pandemic has hit everyone all over the world. And we have seen many, in fact, almost all countries really pull in and try to serve their own people and their own citizens first. And the way we see it is that in Asia, that was already the case. The pandemic has further strengthened the impetus for Asians to uh, give more locally within their borders. This also has fed into um, another trend that we observed before the pandemic hit that we think uh, the pandemic has just strengthened, which is that even before the pandemic hit, we saw that foreign funding was declining in 10 out of 18 Asian economies. And um, on average, with a quarter of uh, the budget of uh, the typical average Asian nonprofit coming from foreign funding, they, that decline means that most of them need to look for resources elsewhere. And uh, as you can see from the slide, 81% of them are actually turning to domestic donors. So we are seeing uh, an increasing pressure on domestic donors to give more, which is why it's critical to understand and to, um, to contribute to maximizing Asia for Asia private social investment at this point in time. Um, I, okay, let's talk about the third trend, which is there is a rising interest in social enterprises and impact investing. So what are social enterprises? Quickly, for those of you who may not be familiar, they're organizations that use business operations to meet a social or environmental need. They are mostly for profits, but they can also be nonprofits that generate revenue that work like a business, but just plow back all the profit back in. So these social enterprises are a welcome, um, uh, you know, a, a, a welcome addition to the organizations that are trying to deliver social services and meet society's needs. We see encouragingly, eighty-five percent of donors are actually showing more interest in donating to or investing in social enterprises. But the investment piece has, um, is really lagging and there's a long way to go there. And again, if there's interest in this, I'm happy to speak to it more later, but for now, I'll just leave you with this, um, uh, with, with this statistic that Asia has 60% of the world's population. It has 50% of the world's GDP, but it receives only 16% of global impact investment. And even that impact investment, we think, is actually coming in more from the West into Asia, into countries like India and Vietnam um, and other Southeast Asian and South Asian countries. But homegrown impact investment 
is really lagging, although there is much potential. Um, when we asked our network of ultra high net worth individuals, do you want to do impact investing? Almost 90% of them said yes, uh, but very few of them are actually doing it right now. And there are a number of reasons for that that we can uh, chat about later uh, if there's interest. A fourth trend, and there's a lot of opportunity here, is that there are greater expectations on business. Um, there is pressure from governments and from societies on businesses that have done well, especially during the pandemic, to do more. And it's not just pandemic related. The fact that we have an existential climate crisis means that there is greater pressure for corporate citizens to demonstrate that they are actually citizens of this world and contributing to people and planet thriving. So we see this reflected in a number of ways. We see that in uh, uh, eight stock exchanges out of the 18 that we look at, these stock exchanges require or um, have or encourage ESG reporting, environmental, social governance reporting. And in fact, there are a couple more countries that are um, introducing this legislation where it's in the pipeline. But for now, where we do see it yeah, are Hong Kong, Singapore, Sri Lanka, India, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, and Vietnam. So this is a, a welcome trend um, and one that we expect will actually become even more common in the next few years. We also see that with the decline in foreign funding and corporate funding only making up about 15% of an average social delivery organization's budget in Asia, there is greater pressure for corporate giving to pick up. And there are a number of ways that corporates can engage, whether it's through corporate philanthropy or through investment in social enterprises or through weaving um, social enterprises into their supply chains. And we're seeing all of these, we're seeing action and examples in all of these um, happening within Asia. I can share one example with you, which is uh, of Rakuten, a software uh, giant in Japan that actually houses its own social incubator where it incubates social enterprises and lends these social enterprises software, technical expertise, marketing expertise, uh, and helps them get off the ground. Another important way in which companies are um, already engaging with nonprofits, but there's, uh, you know, that's much valued and there's pressure on them to do more is by contributing their skills and their expertise. We see that through volunteering, but we see that especially through um, sitting on a uh, corporate representative sitting on 74% of the boards of uh, nonprofits across Asia. And what these corporate representatives are bringing to nonprofits uh, is their expertise in, in accounting, in financial forecasting, uh, in legal advice, in IT, uh, et cetera. So this is um, a trend that is healthy and that we expect will continue to grow. A big part of more expectations on business is also how businesses are engaging, not just with social sector organizations, but with the government itself. In what we see are these joint ventures, we call them public-private partnerships for social good, where governments, companies or their representatives are working together to meet social or environmental needs and to serve communities. In fact, 88% of Asian business leaders believe that these public-private partnerships for social good will become even more common in the next five years. And again, to give you a couple of examples, um, I don't know if you've heard of the Philippines Disaster Resilience Foundation. It is the largest disaster relief and rebuilding organization in the Philippines. It's funded by 61 companies and mandated with a government mandate to help Philippines better prepare and rebuild from disasters. Um, the Trust Schools program in Malaysia is, was a private sector initiative that uh, uh, helps improve the quality of education in public schools. In India, the government um, asked the top corporations in uh, the state of Maharashtra to help improve livelihoods in the thousand most left behind villages. So we see more and more of these public-private partnerships for social good. And it's, it's not a surprise. Um, because they are a win-win-win when handled well and when done correctly. Uh, governments are able to crowd in private capital and further deliver on their mandate um, for delivering social services to society. 
companies earn social capital with government and with communities, and communities, of course, benefit from expanded access to or greater um, social service delivery. So it can work well uh, across Asia. And in fact, our latest study is on public-private partnerships for social good, if you would like more information on that. Um, stemming from that is the final trend, which is we think that cross-sector partnerships across Asia will actually continue to rise. And we think that the most common type of this partnership is actually going to be with, between governments and companies. Often, social sector organizations are part of it, so it's not a two-sector partnership. It's mostly a tri-sector partnership. But what's really interesting is that um, governments and companies are engaging in these kinds of partnerships more and more often across Asia. And we see a few reasons for this. One is that governments are actually asking whether they're asking directly or indirectly. Of the 20 plus public-private partnerships that we looked at, just under half were actually, um, uh, were, were actually arose out of a direct or indirect ask by government, whether it's the Philippines Disaster Resilience Foundation, which I just um, spoke about, or the Maharashtra Village Transformation Initiative, which I also just spoke about, or the Pracharat scheme in Thailand, uh, which led to 24 companies partnering with government in 12 social areas to help improve livelihoods across Thailand. So governments are asking, um, and that's you know something that companies and other institutions um, can prepare for and keep an eye out on. A second reason that this is happening is that companies are recognizing that they can contribute to social service delivery. Um, for example, April Group, which is uh, one of the largest manufacturers of pulp in Indonesia, uh, recognized that it can contribute its knowledge of the environment to serve uh, the, the national mandate of conserving peat forests. So it stepped up itself. When the government wanted uh, private sector partners, it decided to step up. So companies want to contribute their expertise. In fact, as you can see from the figure there, 55% of top Asian business leaders believe that their greatest value add to these PPPs is the management expertise that they're bringing. And the final two reasons are, there is absolutely an increased understanding of profit with purpose. Um, the fact that profit and purpose can go hand in hand together. And also these partnerships really, um, uh, they, they might, they'll pro proliferate because they leverage the uniquely Asian importance of investing in relationships with government and relationships with community. Relationships with government to earn, uh, actually there's a very good uh, Chinese term that captures this well, uh, the idea of Guan Shi, which is investing in long-term relationships to earn social capital. And with communities, that social capital is equally critical because it gives companies the license to operate. So for all of these reasons, we are seeing the rise of PPPs. And I realize I have absolutely gone over my 30 minutes. So I'm going to wrap up with my final slide, which is just a reminder for some of the things that can help us build back better in Asia. And one is embracing this multi-sector approach that the pandemic has actually lifted and showcased. The second is leaning into Asia's comparative advantages in taking a longer term view and working alongside government, leaning into, uh, the, the, you know, uh, leaning into uh, serving society, um, especially when it's, the government is send, say, sending clear signals about where they are looking for help, um, because the sum is absolutely greater uh, than its parts when sectors collaborate and come together. Uh, thirdly, identifying and documenting innovative models and solutions. When we do our research, we find innovations all across Asia. But at the same time, we find that these innovators are not telling their stories. They're not showcasing their models. Uh, and that's one of the things that, we, that CAPS is trying to rectify to make sure that Asian voices actually receive a global and a regional platform. And finally, let's utilize technology improved communications in social media um, and business savvy to increase trust. So with that, I will end my presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Mevesh, for a very informative uh, presentation. Does anyone have any questions? I certainly have one or two things, but uh, anyone got anything they want to ask at this stage? 
Ah, we do have a question from Matthew. Um, given the cross-sector engagement that's on the rise in Asia, do you think there's any value in continuing to think in terms of government, business sector and not-for-profit sector, or leave the language of sectors behind and think about new ways of how people act together in the social and political arena? So are, are they old, defunct categories? I think too early to say um, it's it. Every sector has its comparative advantages. The way I see the rise of these collaborations is that they play to the comparative advantage of each sector. So there's no harm in recognizing that each sector is distinct um, uh, from each other. I mean, I think although the lines are blurring, perhaps more between. Uh, profit and purpose. So between the private sector and the social sector, um, I, I don't think that government will, uh, you know, lose that th 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 that boundary of what holds of uh, why it's called government anytime soon. So no, I don't think that those lines will blur. Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing either. The important thing is more than whether who is called what or who belongs to what sector. If sectors can learn to trust each other and come together that will result in initiatives that better serve society. And here, Asia already has a comparative advantage because in Asia, institutions do tend to work in tandem with government. Um, they too tend to listen to government signals. So it's no surprise that when um, uh, Xi Jinping announced a five-year plan to eradicate poverty um, and then awarded um, uh, the actors and institutions that had helped China achieve that goal at the end of December, 2020, no surprise that companies were uh, a big cohort of the awardees because companies did step up and step in and help uh, meet this goal. So sectors coming together to meet social needs is a positive trend. It's a trend we think plays to Asia's strength. It's a trend that we think will proliferate and a lot of business leaders agree with us. Does it necessitate or mean that the lines between sectors need to blur? No, although there will be some blurring of lines, especially between the private sector and the social sector. Thank you very much, Mavesh. Jamie Lee, um, hello, Jamie. Good to have you join us today. Has a question also. Um, to what extent do you think, Mavesh, are perceptions about wealth management structures as important as the reality in encouraging and facilitating social investment. Um, can I ask a question? What do you mean by wealth management structures? Jamie, would you like to chip in? Yeah, if I can turn on the microphone. Thank you. Thank you so much. <coughs> Sorry, Jamie Lee from King's College London. Uh, yeah, so I was just wondering about the, the mechanisms and the, the choices following on from Matthew's question, really, I suppose, about different vehicles for achieving these things, but your um, fascinating interrogation of the kind of matrix of, of social, political and, and fiscal structures. I just wondered about how much it is also a kind of mentality challenge around what people think works or achieves those kinds of goals, particularly within different jurisdictions. Does that make sense? Um, I think let me let me reframe that uh, a, a little bit uh, and you know, kind of take it to um, how formal are the mechanisms through which people are engaging with social investment? Does that capture the spirit of what you're asking? Thank okay. you. Okay, <laughs> sure. We know that in Asia, um, formal mechanisms, especially in terms of foundations, don't tend to exist to the same degree that they do in the rest of the world. They aren't, there isn't that proliferation of foundations, but let me, uh, before I explain what I mean by that, let me um, clarify that I'm by no means saying that Asians are not charitable. Asians are extremely charitable. Um, uh, you must have heard of the World Giving Index and you know, Asian countries always tend to top that table. Um, so the question is not whether or not Asians are charitable. There's a long history of Asians being charitable. And in fact, you know, kind of a, uh, a paternalistic approach to communities that need help, the local, a uh, well-off person is, or family is expected to look after their um, their constituents. I mean, they, you know, there's, I don't know if you've heard of Jamshedpur, which is actually an entire city in India named after Jamshedji Tata. 
Um, and the expectation was that because he was a well-known business leader, he should be able to support the community at large. So that expectation has always been there. And Asian business leaders and businesses have fulfilled that expectation um, for a long time. Um, and we know that Asians are charitable from the you know, very poor to the very rich. But the reason that a lot of the countries that top the world giving index, but actually don't perform as well on the doing good index, hits right at your question. The doing good index is looking at the structures in place for systematic, large scale philanthropic giving. And in many Asian economies, there is room for improvement in those structures, whether it's tax incentives. Uh, and like I said, a, a lot of Asian economies actually don't have very high taxes in the first place. So in the US, a tax incentive uh, may be more powerful than in a country that has you know, a 15% rate of income tax. That doesn't mean the signals don't, won't matter, but the context is slightly different. So Asian economies can improve that. Uh, is, state taxes do matter. And out of the 18 that we look at, only four or five have any state taxes to begin with. Um, and that's you know, one area that I see where um, uh, governments can absolutely intervene and create, put in place more um, you know, strong incentives for these formal structures to come up. But the second thing I want to say is that foundations may not exist, uh, you know, may not prol proliferate to the same level um, in, in Asia as they, as they do elsewhere, but foundations also mean different things in Asia. So uh, we distinguish between operating foundations and grant making foundations to a much bigger degree in Asia. A lot of Asian foundations tend to be operating foundations. Um, others are grant making and then there's sub granting. So that doesn't you know, mean that this is worse or better, but it's good to understand how Asians are structuring their giving. A third thing we see is that, um, Although uh, you know, maybe a family foundation does not exist, but the principal of the business who often wears two hats, both the principal business leader, also the philanthropic decision maker is engaged in multiple ways that kind of all flow together. So his or her uh, corporate giving, individual giving and family giving, even without whether there is formal structures or not will still flow together. And that again creates um, an opportunity because when, when uh, decision-making is concentrated, it also means that large resources can move very quickly once this decision-maker decides where it should go. I hope that answers some of your question. I'm glad to say the questions are coming in thick and fast. We've got 10 minutes before we should draw to a close. So uh, Joyman has the next question. I don't know if you'd like to switch your video on, say hello uh, as I read the question. Yes. Good, Hi, good yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thomas' question is, I can certainly see the benefit of government and regulation in building trust and developing a healthy um, philanthropic ecosystem, but uh, I wonder if there are issues like education and long-term cultural change, which may also be important. Um, and Joyman draws attention to the differences in these between um, all the different Asian countries, 16 countries, and to further economies that you've been looking at. So do you think that is going to be a, a significant contributor to improving philanthropy, Nevesh? I think not just philanthropy, but all kinds of social investment. So, you know, this is why I, I am careful to use the, the term social investment because um, there, there is more of a spectrum of ways where uh, wealth owners and asset owners can engage with the social sector than there have ever been. Uh, through investments, through loans, uh, you know, debt and equity, uh, as well as philanthropy. So uh, absolutely, German, I think the more things that can be thrown at this issue, the better. Um, culture and education absolutely have a role to play. And I want to speak to that from two perspectives. One is the perspective of the donor or the investor, and the other is the perspective of the recipient, whether it's a nonprofit or a social enterprise. From the perspective of a donor or a giver, I've noticed that uh, most of these social investors are very successful business people. And when they're making business decisions, they will do a lot of due diligence. They will set mechanisms in place where information can flow both to them and from them to, uh, you know, and track where the, the funds are flowing, um, ensure that their, their vision for where these funds should go is clearly spelled out. But when it comes to the social sector, that same kind of due diligence 
is not applied. And the resources needed for that due diligence are often not deployed. Um, so uh, uh, one part of the culture change is actually changing that. When giving money or investing money in the social sector, absolutely do due diligence. If you can't do it yourself, um, hire someone who can. That's very, very important. Um, and from the recipient's perspective, actually a lot can be done without having to necessarily change policies. So uh, social delivery organizations can tell their stories a lot better. There's no reason why in this day and age, anyone should not have a website other than they don't have the resources and the skills. And that is an absolutely real problem in this sector. It's, it's, it's kind of a vicious cycle. There's not enough unrestricted funding. Funding is tied to projects. Communications or marketing are seen as unnecessary overheads uh, and they don't get funded. Um, one way of plugging that gap is by people who have this kind of experience to really contribute their skills so that nonprofits and social enterprises can tell their stories better and be more transparent, have website. Even if the government does not want, you know, advertise your annual reports, publish them online. Because we did see that although most governments do require annual reporting and annual auditing, these records are not made public. So when donors want to invest in the sector, they either have to go and ask for these records or these organizations can just publish them on their websites. We found another very encouraging trend uh, and a couple of economies uh, demonstrate this. Uh, Philipp both Philippines and Pakistan, the social sector has taken transparency signaling into their own hands. There are two bodies, um, the PCNC in the Philippines and the PCP in Pakistan that actually do the due diligence and then publish uh, organizations that have passed their due diligence um, uh, uh, you know, processes uh, on the website. And in fact, in Pakistan, uh, this has filled such an immense gap that the government, the, the revenue department um, grants tax exemption on the basis of the due diligence that this social sector body is doing of its own peers. So we don't have to wait for policies. Uh, there's a lot that can be done outside of that as well. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jermaine, for the question. We've got two more questions, which I hope we've got time for in the five minutes remaining before it's break time. Uh, first of them is from Hang Wu. Um, his question is, is there a problem because some countries, governments don't trust the social sector and vice versa? And is that a reason for the difficulty in some countries for collaboration between the social sector and governments? Absolutely. Um, I, I hinted at this with the uh, changes in regulations where we see that 10 out of 18 economies are seeing changes in regulations. And we see that governments have justifiable reasons for increased scrutiny in some cases. Uh, there is fear, legitimate fear of terrorist financing. There is legitimate fear of money laundering. Absolutely. But um, it seems that when policies are enacted, quite often they tend to paint the entire sector with the same brush. It, it's, it's kind of uh, what we like to say is, you know, guilty till proven innocent. So the attitude that um, some governments take to the social sector is not one of, we are here to support you, therefore we want more transparency so more funding can flow, but we are suspicious of you. Therefore, we want as many policies that will um, uh, increase, uh, you know, to increase transparency and accountability so that we can learn to trust you. So I think that shift is very important of government beginning to think of the social sector as a partner and not as a, um, as, as, as a sector to be managed and scrutinized and controlled. Um, you know, and this is not happening all over Asia, but it is happening to some degree in uh, a lot of Asian countries. So that shift is important. I think the pandemic is helping shift some of that thinking. And governments have realized that they absolutely cannot meet all needs alone. And therefore we do see them leaning quite um, uh, openly on, on the private sector, but we've also seen them before the private sector you know, comes in with, with funding, who's the implementer, often the implementer is either local government, government itself, or local nonprofits. And we have seen a lot of collaboration between local governments and community organizations and local nonprofits 
to um, ensure that people are not left behind during the pandemic. So if that can, that momentum can continue, that will definitely help build more trust because a lack of trust between government and the social sector, uh, and you're right, that flows both ways as well, um, is it, 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 it holds back uh, the social investment that can go towards meeting social needs. Thanks, Mavish. I think we have time for one more question before break, um, a, a swift answer perhaps. Um, John Picton has asked, I wondered about the state coordination of remittances and whether this is a potential relevance to help grow the um, philanthropic sector in Asia. For example, low cost electronic transfers of funds to get right. donations flowing. I, I, quick answer to that would be absolutely, um, it matters more for some economies and doesn't matter much for other economies. So um, I think it will have uh, importance in those pockets where remittances are, uh, are, 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 are critical. Although again, COVID is appending that model as well. We, we, so you know, it's, it's a bit of a wait and see what happens there. Great, well, thank you to all our questioners. Thank you, John, Hang Wu, Joyman, uh, and Matthew. It's been a great discussion. That's brought us very accurately to the end of this session. So a very big thank you to Mevesh for an excellent, very informative presentation. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for having me.